and original. From Story Studio Network. I'm Aaron Trafford in Halifax. I'm Dave Trafford in Toronto. And this is Now and Next. This week, Now and Next brings you a special Remembrance Week series. Brought to you by the RCAF Foundation. As we approach Remembrance Day, November 11th, here in Canada, we're called upon to acknowledge and honor the years of service our veterans have afforded this country and the sacrifices they made, often with their lives. But it's also an opportunity to celebrate the rich history of this country that has informed and shaped our culture, our national identity, and our place in the world. I'm Dave Trafford. I'm Aaron Trafford. In this limited podcast series, we endeavor to explore some of the stories that are uniquely rooted in the history of the Royal Canadian Air Force and Canadian Aviation. Welcome to Pathway to the Stars. It was a feat of post-war ingenuity and innovation. A supersonic jet designed and intended to defend against the clear and present danger of a missile attack against Europe and North America. It was a new interceptor intended to be the centerpiece for the first line of defense against the very real threat of long-range Soviet bombers capable of delivering nuclear strikes in the Cold War. This is the Avro Arrow, Canada's entry into the supersonic era. Within the short span of four years, the Arrow was brought from initial design to the start of the development flight program. So vast was this project that during the next 20 minutes, we can do no more than give a series of impressions of the planning and hard work that was required. The full design study for the Arrow got the go-ahead in 1953. The Arrow 1, Canada's first supersonic fighter plane, is ready to fly after five years of work and planning by 5,000 people at Admiral of Canada near Toronto. The Arrow led the CBC News as it progressed to its first flight five years later. A new weapon of defense has been added to the arsenal of the Western world. The design and the development of the Avro Arrow was beyond impressive. But it was all part of Canada's place in ensuring the security in Europe, in Canada, and in the United States. The commitment that Canada made, the Canadian military made, to the security of Europe um, was huge. I spoke to Erin Gregory. She's the curator of the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa. And the commitment that Canada made to the security of North America was also huge, especially in that early part of the Cold War. The Soviet nuclear threat was real. Let us face without panic the reality of our times, the fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities, and let us prepare for survival, understanding the weapon that threatens us. The Canadian government's answer was to make huge investments in the RCAF. In terms of the amount of money that was thrown at the Air Force, like the 1950s were really their heyday. Um, You know, they got more money than any of the other services at that time because of this threat. If you live in an apartment house, rules for taking shelter will be posted in your building. Learn them. Also, learn the location of public shelters in areas where you work or frequently visit. That threat is, is very, very real. Um, and so it pushes the technology, um, I think, in, in, at an, an incredible pace. And Avro for Canada was right in the center of all of that. So, I mean, the, the, the politics uh, around the whole, all the decisions to scrap the program it seems odd to me based on that level of urgency, the imminent clear and present danger that the you know we we faced in the cold war in the 50s that there would have been that kind of political nitpicking that effectively killed what was you know 
to say it was a you know a, an industry leader understates what the what the, the era was well i think a lot of people really don't like to believe that so much of it comes down to money but in a lot of cases it really comes down to money and this was not just a deep in, a deep in baker thing wouldn't it have been much easier for me on behalf of the government to have continued the arrow. Saint was also very much concerned about the amount of money that was that was being poured into this this program. Even the Air Force was very concerned about the money that was going to be uh, poured into the program, given the level of ambition. Even though this was all based on on requirements, right? That they that they had come up with themselves. The Aero was, you know, a new airframe, a new engine, a new weapon system, um, you know, the, the height of technology for all of these things. Like This is an incredibly ambitious program for a country of our size, right? So the amount of money that's getting into it is, is huge. The post-war boom is starting to drop off. And one of the biggest things that happened, you know, unfortunately to the Aero is Sputnik, right? So on the very day, October 4th, 1957, that the first arrow was rolled out to enormous fanfare. On the afternoon of October 4th, 1957, crowds began to assemble in front of an Avro aircraft hangar at Malton, Ontario. People are totally freaked out by this beep, 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 beep of Sputnik in the air. So now nobody has any idea what war is going to look like. CBS television presents a special report on Sputnik 1, the Soviet space satellite. Douglas Edwards reporting. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite... The in scenario for which the arrow was designed of intercepting a Soviet bomber that was armed with a nuclear weapon, taking it down somewhere far away from super populated areas in southern Canada and the northern US, that no longer looks like that's going to be the war that we're fighting anymore, right? So now we're thinking like, you know, are they going to arm these satellites with nuclear weapons? Do they have lasers on them? Like, what are the Soviets up to? Nobody knows, right? This is this is a very shocking and concerning uh, thing to have happen. And it really changes the way people at certain levels feel about the arrow um, and the utility of it. And why are we dumping all of this money into something that may not actually do what we need it to do? Uh, the other thing is missiles. So the whole thing about intercontin intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know, you can't put a you can't put an interceptor up against those things. It didn't seem like that was going to be the way forward anymore. And so as the costs start to balloon and balloon and balloon, and there were still millions more dollars that were going to be poured into this program before this aircraft actually became, um, you know, what it was meant to be. There, there's so many things that happen to that project, and, and a lot of it is about money, and a lot of it is about timing. John Diefenbaker was the prime minister who made the decision to shut down the arrow. The buck stops here. And it wasn't just about a line item in a federal budget. Shuttering the arrow project meant real people lost high-skilled, high-paying jobs. And in communities like Brampton, where a quarter of the labor force worked for Avro, hundreds must also move in search of new jobs. I knew that 10,000 men and women would be out of work, ultimately, by this decision. I knew that a great industry that had been established would be weakened, but it was right to end it. A young CBC reporter named Morley Safer pulled the assignment on Black Friday. That was February the 20th, 1959, to cover the closure and the effects no on the small town of Brampton, Ontario. And here the human factor enters the picture. News Magazine editor Morley Safer reports. Brampton is probably typical of scores of other Canadian towns. Population, 14,500. Main Street on Saturday afternoon. The usual busy hustle and bustle of shopping day. Only this Saturday, less business. 
Small talk and gossip cover a single topic today, the end of the era. Now, in that moment, about 30,000 jobs evaporated when the Arrow was canceled. That includes those working on production and those employed in the supply chain. But you'd think the innovation and technology would have survived that, right? Not the case. All the engines, production tooling, and technical data were ordered to be destroyed. The official reason was concern the Soviets would get their hands on this secret material used to build the arrow. Avro ceased operations in 1962. The question is, what was the fallout? I put the question to Aaron Gregory. What was lost when we shut that down? Well, I think, I mean, the... the the obvious things are what happened uh, in the aftermath. So Avro doesn't survive much longer than than Black Friday. So they have a few contracts, particularly in the secret projects division that enable the company to survive until about 1962. And then, you know, they have to kind of shut their doors and, and shut down. So what happens is you have hundreds of incredible minds uh, particularly on the engineering side in this aerospace industry that are now looking for jobs. And unfortunately, with the state of the aerospace industry in Canada, particularly at the time, not all of those people could find viable careers in aerospace in Canada. And so that forces them to look elsewhere. So some of these people um, you know, were, were expats from the UK. Many of them returned to, to jobs in aerospace in the UK. And a lot of them brought all that experience from Avro with them to work on programs like the Concorde um, and a bunch of other things for British Aerospace. And then, you know, of course, for, for our purposes, there were 12 very notable Canadians that really did a lot for the NASA's space program, um, in particular, the, the Apollo programs, um, you know talking about like Owen Maynard, for example, uh, being one of the principal designers on the Lunar Lander, for example, and pushing a certain type of trajectory to to get to the moon and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of just, you know, incredibly brilliant people. And I think that's what, you know, what, what people tend to think about the most is this like, okay, we've got this this incredible brain drain. Like what would all these minds have done if they stayed in Canada? And that's a great question. And yes, that is a great question. And we have an answer. We'll meet a guy whose dad worked on the Arrow and then wound up in Houston. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want to learn more about our Canadian aviation history, visit the RCAF Foundation website. It's rcaffoundation.ca. While you're there... Well, you just might want to donate to the RCAF Foundation scholarships offered to Canada's next generation of aviation and aerospace leaders. All right, we, we do need to take a minor detour, though, to tell you the rest of this story. So you were doing the weekend morning show on News Talk 1010 mm-hmm. in Toronto in the summer of 2019. Yeah. And you just happened to be on the air on July 20th, which was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Yeah, we got our geek on that morning. I I mean, (laughs) it was just great history. And when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the Apollo project. I can remember vividly, you know, dad making the effort to make sure that we stopped on that Sunday night (laughs) to see this grainy picture of you know, Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. So that morning we had a great time. We were recounting and retelling the stories around the moon landing. Now, as we're doing so, the show host, who was coming on after me, he is sitting in the control room, as he is wont to do, waiting for his show to start. And in the course of my show, he tells our technical producer, well, he knew the Apollo astronauts. (laughs) So this is Frank Cohn, and he hosted the Home Improvement Show. Yeah, yeah, he's the hammer and nails guy. So it turns out Frank's father worked on the Arrow, and the rest of the stories just 
crazy. Yes, Dad worked for Avro many years. He actually was helping develop the computerized systems. And in those days, with their computers were the size of an office building and punching out <laughs> five billion little cards with holes yes. in it and stuff. And I remember as a young kid uh, coming home from school and my parents all upset because it was Black Friday. Everybody at Avro was laid off. And my poor mother and father, five little kids, I think we're all under the age of 10, wondering what the heck they were going to do. And the next thing we know, dad gets a phone call from NASA saying, do you want a job? So we literally packed up almost immediately and moved to the Lang near the Langley Air Force Base in Newport News, Virginia, where NASA was initially located before they moved to Houston. And we ended up moving into a brand new subdivision that was being built for the astronauts and all the support crew. So uh, our immediate next door neighbor was uh, Gus Grissom. Uh, a couple of doors down was Wally Shira. Up the block was uh, Deke Slayton. Uh, went to school with their kids. And I can remember when uh, Virgil... So for those of you following along at home, he has just <laughs> yeah. named like the seven <laughs> most famous astronauts in the 1960s. I yeah. mean, really. So I got to meet basically all the original astronauts. And I can remember uh, when Gus Grissom uh, came, went up into space and all the cameras were all over their front yard and Betty Grissom came out very upset, kicked them off her property. They came into our property. My mother tried to get them to get off our property. They wouldn't listen. And something that's not known is I had a little cat named Snowball who was outside and loved the TV cameras. And these cameras were monstrous because of all the cords. And we're looking out the window because mom didn't want us going outside. Next thing you know, we see one of the cameras go smashing over. So they packed up and went to the country club across the street. Is this because of the cat? Yes. <laughs> the cat, At least that's what I it. like to think. You know, that's, just, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. The killer cat. The, the killer, killer cat. Defending the turf. Yeah. But, but, uh, uh, and, be, and, and, and again, we were talking a little earlier about how hard it was to get to the moon, how difficult it was. It was a dangerous thing. Gus Grissom was killed. Uh, and, Grissom, White, and Chaffee yeah. burnt up in the capsule on the ground because of an oxygen leak in the capsule, and they had all these loose wires inside. It was extreme negligence on the part of NASA, which was proven. It didn't need to happen, and they had been warned about this. The astronauts had complained about the conditions inside the capsule, and unfortunately, it took something major like that to happen. Frank's dad ends up at NASA, and among other things... This guy did the math to figure out where the space capsules would land. A fascinating thing was my dad was responsible for calculating where the capsule would land in the ocean. Mm. And they said that when he was doing it, they always had the most accuracy. And when he wasn't doing it, eh. A little off, were they? <laughs> and if it wasn't for the, what was going on in the States at the time, the, the, the Vietnam War, yep. my parents were terrified because we were Canadians about us getting drafted. And the race riots in Houston because NASA then moved everything to Houston yes. and mother didn't want us being involved in all that. So then dad, I don't know whether he really wanted to, but gave up, gave it up and came back and went to work for IBM developing their computers. I don't know if I even appreciated what was going on at the time until I got a lot older. Because mm. when you're living in it, I don't say you don't appreciate it, but it was many years later that I really said, my God, I was right there. Yeah. And even today, I mean, 50, I think, where did 50 years go? I still find it <laughs> mind blowing to it. So I'm going to have to go right back now and rewatch the right stuff and see <laughs> your house when they, when, when she tries to chase them off there. Off the, yeah, off I think the, they missed the, the and they missed the part about the cat. The cat. That, that we'll Frank lived across the street from Gus Grissom, one of the astronauts who was actually killed in an accident. And it was a regular campsite, he said, for media of the day. It was insanity. <laughs> there were yeah. hundreds of people all yeah, on the street, well. all over her property. But uh, Gus Grissom was an amazing gentleman. He loved to hunt. And I remember coming home one day from school and he was butchering a huge black bear right in his driveway. Oh, <laughs> dressing the bear. Just before, you, I just want to footnote on this. I want to point out that Frank's dad was the guy who did the math to make sure they could accurately determine where the capsule was going to land when they come back from space. Frank can't run a computer. He can barely use his phone. So I don't know what was lost <laughs> genetically there. <laughs> well, with, so with all of this in the background, it, it is really easy to understand why folks were disappointed about the cancellation of the Arrow and the subsequent demise of Avro. There's this prevailing narrative that Canada's aerospace industry kind of just died on Black Friday. And that's simply not true. 
Aaron Gregory says Canada has the fifth largest aerospace industry in the world, including some global leading companies. Uh, we just don't build and design our own aircraft. Um, but we had other amazing companies like de Havilland that built incredible aircraft that were used for a variety of purposes. Um, Canada Air, which also, you know, did a lot of great things in, in the aerospace industry as well. And were also very innovative and, and that. And so, you know, there's, there is definitely a sadness to the Avro and the Aero story. But that's not the end of, of aviation in Canada by any stretch of the imagination. By any stretch of the imagination. It's a great place to leave off. Because it's pretty much where we started. The history of the RCAF, the history of Canadian aviation, is all about stretching the imagination. This now and next series, Pathway to the Stars, is produced for the RCAF Foundation by Story Studio Network. And we'd encourage you to go over to their website, check them out, rcaffoundation.ca. And while you're there, you may want to consider donating to the RCAF Foundation scholarships offered to Canada's next generation of aviation and aerospace leaders like Trisha Verdi. By 16, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in aviation as a pilot, and I introduced the idea to my parents, but I was met with disapproval since it wasn't a female-like career. To overcome this adversity, I didn't listen. To justify my career choice, I had the opportunity to participate in events such as Brampton Flight Club's Women in Aviation Day. This not only marked my first introductory, but also my first encounter with a female pilot. She became my role model and validated my dreams of becoming the next female Chuck Yeager. This experience encourages me to share this opportunity with other females. So, I volunteer for this annual event whenever I can since it's a meaningful contribution to the future of the aviation community as it encourages the ambition of aspiring young female pilots. Your money helps with those ambitions and those dreams. Again, go to rcffoundation.ca and make a donation today. Now and Next is produced by Becky Coles. Our production manager is Jamie Nickerson. Our audio editors are Mike Trutler and Drew Garner. Our sonic logo designer is Greg McDonald. And our executive producers are me, Dave Trafford, and Aaron Trafford. Thanks for listening. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.